Hello and welcome to this webinar related to OPC communications. My name is Dave Hammond from Mac Solutions. I'm the product manager for the Kepware software, the Kepware OPC communications software here in the UK. And uh, we've been selling the OPC software from Kepware since 2001. This webinar is designed for uh, the following um, audience um, who may need to know a little bit more about OPC and, and what it does and where it fits. Um, this includes automation engineers who might interact with or come across OPC on an occasional basis in their jobs, or perhaps engineers who are configuring or managing SCADA applications who need to understand where OPC fits in their topology and in their project. Um, there are also uh, um, software and IT engineers who may be coming from a uh, world outside automation systems who are coming across OPC for the first time and just need to understand where it fits. And the same applies for security staff working in IT departments um, who need to understand what OPC is, uh, again, where it fits, but also what are the implications of using it and are there any security implications for using different types, which we'll come on to later. There's also a related webinar um, available on YouTube, which is a webinar I did a little while ago, uh, which is related to um, all the different things that you can do with the Kepware OPC software, uh, shows all the different topologies and types of applications. So if you'd like to have a look at that as well, that's a, a different, different uh, uh, type of webinar, but it covers a similar ground to this one. Okay, so what happened before OPC? What was, uh, what was the picture like before OPC came along? Before OPC, there was no standard communications between uh, industrial devices, you know, for instance, PLCs, and applications that needed to use real-time data from, shop, from the shop floor um, and visualize it or use it or log it or, or consume it in some fashion. Each manufacturer of the software had to create their own native drivers for the various different types of hardware uh, that, that were found on the shop floor. So you'd find an HMI or SCADA company writing a driver for different types of PLCs. So in this diagram, you'll see that the, the SCADA company is writing a, a native driver for type A to communicate to PLCs type A and writing another driver for uh, communicating to PLCs of type B. But what happens if that SCADA software or that um, HMI type software uh, needed to communicate to a, a PLC type C? Uh, what happens if they, the, the, the SCADA company or the HMI software company hadn't written a driver for that? Um, in effect, that, that software would not be able to communicate to those PLCs. So what you had was, was a situation whereby uh, the the proprietary natures of drivers meant that HMI and SCADA companies had to continually write new drivers for their software. Uh, and if they didn't have the correct ones or the ones that the customer wanted, then their, their, the, their software is of limited appeal to be used by that customer. So if you're faced with that situation, you know, what, how can you overcome that? Well, the answer is you, you really can't. In addition, you had a, a complicated situation with regard to devices on the shop floor. You had more and more control devices with communications ports. You had more and more control devices uh, which need, where their data was needed in more and more applications. And you had more and more people on the shop floor who, are, who were using that information in real time. So you had an increase of communications on the shop floor across the board. It's okay if you've got one PLC and one application of software, or maybe two, or maybe even three. But if you then expand that up, so you end up with lots of different bits of software trying to get data out of the same PLC, and you then multiply that by uh, a number of PLCs, you soon get a situation where, which is very, very hard to manage. You know, how do you manage all that? It's a complete wild west of communications. So. Back in 1995, the OPC Foundation was formed as an independent organization, and there are hundreds of uh, worldwide corporate members now all part of this independent organization. So the idea behind the foundation is to ensure interoperability between automation systems uh, based upon an open standard for communications and allow different vendors to interact with each other uh, independently. 
Okay, so uh, here are a few uh, of the OPC principles. First of all, the OPC technology, the OPC uh, approach is based upon a client server architecture. Uh, that means the client is completely in control of the server. The server doesn't do anything until the client requests it to do so. So the client initiates communications with the server. The client manages the server's behavior. And the server is waiting for incoming requests from the client. So the server is only performing actions as instructed or requested by the client. For instance, a server will only read or write values from the PLC as instructed by the client, only the specific values that the client wants the OPC server will go and read. The OPC client also specifies at what time or upon what interval the OPC server will read values from a PLC. So without OPC, you have a situation whereby the driver and the software which is consuming the data are, are in one package and it all has to be written by the one vendor. With OPC, you have a different topology entirely. You have OPC interactions between the OPC client applications and the server, which means that the OPC client software uh, companies only have to write one interface, which is the OPC interface, and then they have uh, access to lots of different uh, values of data from lots of different types of device. They don't have to continually write new drivers as new bits of equipment get, get launched onto the market. They can stick with OPC as their, as their standard. The OPC server has the means to communicate to lots and lots of different devices. And it's up to the OPC server manufacturers to be con continually updating their server products to keep track of the different changes and the new models which get uh, out, launched onto the market. Um, so that means that a single OPC server can communicate to lots and lots of different types of devices. Uh, for instance, this in the PLC world, they could talk to Rockwell and Siemens and Mitsubishi and Monbus and Omron and, and all lots of different types of vendors, all within the same OPC package. The advantage of having an OPC in place as well is that that OPC server will manage the communications on one side to the SCADA or OPC client applications, and on the other side, it'll manage the communications down to each of the devices. This means that an individual device will only be seeing requests from a single point, the OPC server. It will not be getting or receiving requests from multiple sources, therefore overloading uh, its comms port. It, this minimizes the comms across the network and to the device and uh, helps to manage the flow of data more effectively and more efficiently. In order for the OPC client to be able to get the data from the device effectively, what the OPC server needs to do is provide a menu of of available values. And this is done in the configuration of the OPC server. So in order for the OPC server to request data, it needs to make a request upon the OPC server and the OPC server must then know how to locate that data and return the value to the client. So within the OPC server, the, there must be a certain amount of configuration done. Uh, the, the first configuration would be the channel, which is saying which particular communications protocol will be used over that channel. And each device in that channel limit must be given parameters, such as the device type or PLC model, and also the unique path to reach that particular device, such as the PLC's IP address. Then the list of tags can be added to the configuration. These are the values within the PLC which are of interest to the client applications. Each tag has a name and each name will be a real world name which is meaningful in the client application such as tank 17 underscore level which will be the level in tank number 17. The OPC server then must know how to reach the correct PLC address in order to get that tank 17 level value out. So each tag then has a PLC memory address allocated to it. And also there are certain other properties such as the type of data, whether the, the, the value in question, whether the tag in question is a Boolean one or zero, or whether it's a word or a data word or, a, or such other data types. So once that's been configured, the OPC client can make requests using the tag syntax to the OPC server. 
the OPC server that can then resolve that to a particular device on a particular channel and a particular register in that device to get the value out. The OPC server can then poll for that value, get the response, and then return that response to the OPC client, which is the value that the OPC client needs to use. Now that we've looked at the way that OPC clients and servers interact, um, I want to quickly look back at the old standard of OPC DA, which some people watching this webinar might be more familiar with. This was the OPC DA standard, which is, existed between 1995 and 2009. It's still current in the KEP server product, but it is a legacy standard, which really shouldn't be used now. Uh, and the following slides will illustrate why. The OPC DA uh, interface is based upon very old technologies, based upon Windows DCOM, which is a, an authentication and security model, which was originally uh, launched back in the mid 90s in the first network operating system from Windows, Windows NT. Because it is so old and based upon very old models, it really isn't secure. and and we would not recommend uh, anyone uses OPC DA these days. One of the other things about OPC DA is that it only works on Windows operating systems, unlike the modern standards of OPC. And because OPC DA relies upon Windows networking uh, components, OPC DA can only work between computers on the same Windows domain or on the same Windows workgroup. So in summary, OPC DA cannot be used across domains. It's not secure and really is unsuitable for the types of topologies you find in modern factories where the OPC server is needed in one location or on one domain and the OPC client may be in a different department on a different domain or the other side of a, a router or a firewall. So in many cases, OPC DA should be replaced or upgraded. And there are ways of upgrading from DA to UA fairly seamlessly without throwing away uh, the OPC DA applications in the first place. But that's for a different webinar. The current OPC standard is OPC UA, which is the OPC standard which was launched in 2009 and is still the present standard. It is a completely different model from OPC DA. It's based upon normal rules of networking. The connections are between IP addresses, not based upon Microsoft proprietary technologies. It's very secure. It can be used between any two PCs with IP addresses across any type of LAN or WAN or even across the internet. It's very firewall friendly. And as you'll see in the diagram, it can be on different types of operating systems such as Apple Macs or Linux. So it's far more flexible and far more suited to today's requirements. So how do OPC UA servers and clients communicate? Well, just like with the, with the OPC principles uh, shown earlier, the OPC UA client communicates to the OPC UA server. The only thing that is required between the two of them is the ability for the IP address of the clients to be able to see the IP address of the server and vice versa. The network route can pass through firewalls and routers across domains between departments, across local area networks, wide area networks, or even across the internet. And the reason it can do this, and it can do this securely, is there is a lot of encryption and security built inside OPC UA. It uses public-private key encryption, and it's using, it uses it in both directions. So the OPC UA client key is shared with the server and configured into the server as a valid key. And the OPC UA service key is passed to the client and configured in the client as a valid key. So the interactions in both directions are authenticated and also secured. Because of that, it is suitable for use across any type of topology where the two PCs can see each other's IP addresses. As I mentioned before, you can even use this across the public internet and it will be secure. So in summary, OPC UA is using HTTPS, it's using SSL, it's using TCP, standards that are used across security across all sorts of types of industries. It, there are security certificates exchanged in both directions. 
the encryption is to international standards of RSA 128 and 256. And the KEP server product from Kepware supports self-signed certificates, which you can create inside the software, or you can use externally sourced third-party certificates from known certificate certification authorities. Um, in addition to this security built, built in the OPC UA standard itself, the KEP server product from Kepware also has enhanced OPC client access controls, uh, which is termed security policies. Uh, this is a plugin that's included for free within the KEP server uh, OPC server product. This allows uh, granularity of security from the client, so particular clients can access only particular channels, particular devices, particular device groups, or particular tags, and you can also put on those clients read or write access privileges. So far greater granularity than with the standard OPC UA uh, model. So that's all I wanted to do today was to go through this uh, quick overview of OPC. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact us. Uh, my name is Dave Hammond. I'm the product manager for the communications products at Max Solutions. And as I say, we've been selling this software since 2001. So hopefully uh, we can answer any questions you might have for us. Thanks for your time.